Well, good morning. Wow, I, I was a little worried earlier. There was like three of you in here. I thought, well, maybe we'll just go in the other room and sit where it's cool. I like that idea, Dallas. That was pretty good. Well, we're going to take a little break from uh, James this morning. Um, Truthfully, you know, there's only a few verses left, and Sean, I could tell Sean really wanted to do it himself, so, so we're going to let him do that. And I thought it might be appropriate um, for the worship pastor to talk about worship. And I brought that up to Sean, and he thought that was a good idea. said he hadn't heard a message on worship for a long time. So that's what we're going to do, all right? Before we start, let's pray. Lord, uh, there's, there's some just really odd things about this topic when we begin to look at it. And I pray that you would uh, lead us through all of the twists and turns and help us to understand what worship is really all about and why you want that from us. And we'll give you our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Almost every church that uh, I've ever been a part of has at least some part of their, their week, their, their, you know, especially Sundays, it, 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 that they set apart for worship, what they call worship. But there's really a lot of misunderstanding, I think, about what worship really is. There are a bunch of words, um, activities, if you'd rather call them that, that sort of become synonymous with worship. Actually, they become confused with worship. And so we're going we're gonna to take a look at that. We're going to kind of break that down this morning. In the Bible, we see, you know, we, we read about the sacrificial system. And, and we see that that, you know, that was all, seemed like it was part of worship in the Old Testament. And the New Testament, actually. Same, it was still going on in the New Testament. And, um, you know, they're bringing their animals. And we, we had a sermon on that a long time ago. Um, about about bringing your animals and then they they had the burnt offering and they had the fellowship offerings and, and we think of that somehow as as well that's the way they worshiped in the in in the bible days right but then you know i mean obviously we don't offer animal sacrifices anymore so now we offer what do we do we take up the offering and so we kind of think well the offering offer you know we, we use the same word all right we we think of giving money instead of burning a sacrifice on an altar we think of giving money as our offering and that must have something to do with worship uh, you know a lot of churches call their sunday morning meeting the worship service they've got a, a service in the evening or whatever but the sunday morning service is called the worship service so it probably has something to do with preaching or listening to a sermon or whatever that must have something to do with worship but probably the the most common mistake that most Christians make is to assume that, that worship is all about singing songs, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, music is a powerful tool, and it certainly can help lead us into worship, which is, you know, a good thing for me. Otherwise, I'd be out of a job, right? So, you know, but we're going to see that, that worship is far, far more than singing songs, but since music is so often a part of the process and we, we identify, you know, our singing of songs as, as, as worship, I think it makes sense to talk about it just a little bit. There's all kinds of arbitrary categories of Christian music. And I say arbitrary because, you know, we just make them up, right? There's certain call, kinds of songs that we call worship songs, and usually they're the slower, more meditative song. This is a worship song. But this one over here, it's, it's got a beat to it. It must be a praise song, right? And then, of course, we have hymns, the big old hymnal that used to be in the back of the pew. And, okay, everyone take out your hymnals and turn to song number 538. We'll sing all seven verses with the choruses in between. All right? So, you know, if we're going to truly understand what, what music has to do with worship, it would probably be a good idea to go back and see what the Bible has to say about music. That's usually a pretty effective way to do it. The Bible's a, a, a good authority on biblical things, all right? So actually, there's actually a lot about music in the Bible. Personally, I believe that God loves music. He put music in us. Um, 
if you question that, you know, just watch a little baby in its crib. It hasn't even learned how to walk yet, but it's bouncing up. Anytime there's music going on, it's going. In fact, there was a, a baby in the first service that was doing that in her mom's arms. She was just bouncing up and down. And then, you know, they'd start singing and she would, ah, oh, she'd just sing really loud. It was, you know, it sounded like cr crying, but she was having a good time. She, she was feeling the music, all right? When my grandson Austin was a baby, uh, we, we would sit him at the piano and, you know, little kids like to pound on the piano. He didn't do that. He would play one note at a time. He would, with his little tiny finger, boom, and he'd just get a shiver. And then he'd hit another one. Oh, that, you know, it would move him. As a little baby, the music would move him. And then Lily, our, our granddaughter, we, we used to have this, uh, it was a tuner for a guitar that you blow through. It was kind of like a, a, a pitch pipe, only it was the, the notes of the guitar strings. And, you know, we'd play on that thing just, just for fun to play, to, to let her, you know, to entertain her. And we'd hit a certain note. It wasn't all of them. There was just one note. And every time we hit that note, she would just hook her up and start, you know, tears would get in her eyes and she'd start crying when you, she heard that one note. Music affects our emotions, all right? God put music in us and he attached it to our, emo our emotions. And, and it's a very useful tool. Uh, it breaks through hard hearts. Songs can, can break your heart, all right? I don't like listening to country music because it always makes me cry. It's true, all right? It also, music helps us remember Bible truth, right? Sometimes, you know, you're saying, you know a song, it's like you, you forget what the message was, but you find yourself singing those songs all week long, right? Music can help lift your spirits. It can encourage you. It can convict you. There's all kinds of things. Music is very, very powerful. So well, let's see what the Bible has to say about it. One of the places that it talks about music is in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Now, Paul's, you know, he's, he's, he's actually giving this long discourse. He's, he's giving the Ephesian Christians some, some just good advice about how to live the life that God called you to. And we're going to kind of jump right down into the middle of that conversation and pick it up in the middle. It says, uh, don't spend your time getting drunk, all right? That only leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. And I'm sorry that that has nothing to do whatsoever with drinking alcohol, you know, whether or not, you know, it's not a prohibition. It's just, don't, you know, and it really has nothing to do with other than the fact that it says, be filled with the Spirit, and then right from there, it goes into speak to yourselves with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. All right? That was Paul's advice. So the, the first category of music that he talks about are psalms. All right? We kind of know what psalms are because, you know, we have a, a whole book of them in the Bible, right? In fact, it's the longest book in the Bible. 150 chapters long, all psalms, okay? But just because, you know, I mean, we memorize the Psalms, just because we have some of them memorized doesn't mean we know what they are. Okay, what is a Psalm anyway? Well, the word itself, the word Psalm, actually means to pluck, to strum, or to twang. So clearly it's talking about guitar music, right? No, no. Okay, no joke, no, no laughs for that. I thought I would get a laugh out of that. But seriously, the, 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 that's what the word Psalm means. It means to pluck. To cause to vibrate by touching, to twang, or to play on a stringed instrument. And so when we put that information together with the words of the Psalms that we know about, those, those 150 Hebrew poems in the book, we, we get the idea that Psalms were essentially the contemporary Christian music of the day, if you want. Okay? They were songs about God, and they were accompanied by stringed instruments and percussion. Kind of like what we do every Sunday morning. David. David was called the, the sweet psalmist of Israel. We know he played a mean harp, right? I mean, remember, he got hired to, to play for the king, for King Saul. He could probably really shred on that thing. I don't know. But anyway, the point was that he was a poet. He was a musician. And you clearly get the idea that, you know, the girls were pretty impressed with David. You don't believe me? Check out 1 Samuel 18. You know, they're singing songs about David. Here he comes, you know. 
David, actually that had more to do with his fighting ability than his music, but, but he was kind of a rock star. He really was. That was one of the reasons that, that uh, Saul ended up being so jealous of him. You know, all the ladies loved David. He was, he was more popular than the king, okay? I know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of filling in between the lines here. Because the truth of the matter is that David loved God. And if you read the Psalms, he expressed just about every emotion imaginable in his music. Sometimes he questioned God. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Right? He complained about the way he felt. Lord, I'm in distress. My eye is wasting away from grief. My soul and my body also. He complained a lot. Some of the, a lot of the Psalms were complaining. Sometimes he asked God to take revenge on his enemies. Oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. It's there. It really is. He got impatient. Maybe even a little angry with God. How long, O oh Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry to you and yet you do not save. He got impatient with God. He got angry with God. Sometimes he even got a little self-righteous. Like, vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and the integrity that is in me. Personally, I would never ask God to treat me according to how good I was. Because if he did, I'd, I'd be in big trouble. But you know, David just poured out whatever was in his heart and his mind through his music. Okay, Poured out his heart and his mind to God through his music. Um, sometimes when I've read the Psalms in the past... I, you know, I, I have a hard time relating at times because it seems like his experiences were different than mine. But truthfully, if you take a close look, these songs, these psalms, are the cries of just an ordinary guy trying to make sense of life. And truthfully, they, they teach us a lot about how to relate to God. They tell us that it's okay to cry out. It's okay to express your frustration and your anger. God can take it, right? David did that, and he was called a man after God's own heart. So anyway, back to, back to Ephesians. It says, speak to yourselves with psalms. Now, when it says speak to yourself, it, it can either mean, you know, you're speaking to yourself. I do that. You know, I let the music talk to me. I, I, I let it teach me. It reminds me of the truth. We sang, you're a good, good father, and I'm loved by you. Isn't that, I mean, we need to remind ourselves of that sometimes. Sometimes we think of God as, you know, he's, he's harsh, or he's mean, or he's mad, or maybe he's just absent, because like David, it's like, where are you, God? You know, but he's a good father, and we're loved by him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. We sang that one too. It's interesting because I picked these songs before I knew what, what, uh, um, what we're going to sing this morning. So anyway, the, and then one of my favorite ones is remind me who I am. Okay? So many times it's like I, I forget. I'm, 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 God, I'm, I'm called God's beloved. You're called God's beloved. Okay? And we get busy in life and we, we feel all the pressures and everything and, and, and sometimes we forget who we are. So let, this, let music speak to you. Let music talk to you. Okay? The message of the music gets through in a way that the message of spoken words just doesn't sometimes. So speak to yourselves with psalms. On the other hand, you know, we can be speaking to ourselves. We can be speaking to one another. Some of the songs that we sing speaks, speak to one another. We have all we need. In you. We have all we need in you. All we need is you. The time has come to stand for what we believe in. Right? That's another one we sing. We're the light of the world. We're a city set on a hill. We're, we're talking to one another, reminding ourselves of, of, of what God has said about us as a people. There's power in music that touches our emotions. And that is exactly how David used psalms to express his feelings. Okay. So it says, speak to yourselves with psalms. And then it says, and with hymns. Now, I've already done the, the joke about hymns. I don't think we can get anything more out of that. But basically, you know, it's the big book that used to be in the back of every pew. There's, you know, six or seven hundred songs in there. And we used to sing them every Sunday. We sing five or six hymns every Sunday with the piano and the organ. And that was, you know, that was Sunday morning music. Okay. And for young people especially, it was like... 
you know, it's so different than the kind of music that, that they listen to that it's boring. And, you know, it's not to me because I grew up with it and I, I still, I love hymns. I miss singing them sometimes. But, you know, the word hymn in the Bible is, has very little to do with the kind of songs that are in that book, right? Back when Paul used the term in his letter, uh, it was a type of music, a type of song that people sang to celebrate or praise a hero, okay? Or, or, or someone, a dignitary, or, or, some, or maybe even a god, okay? And it wasn't just Christian hymns. There were, hymns were songs that were exciting. They were stimulating music that focused on the feats of, or accomplishments of some famous person. It was music that stirred you, you know, it impressed you. Probably the closest thing that we have to that today are what we call praise songs, all right? Great and mighty is he, robed in glory, arrayed in splendor, great and mighty is he. Blessing and honor, glory and power be to the ancient of days. We sang that one last week, I think. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Those are the kinds of, of songs that would fit into the category of him, all right, because you're extolling the the the, uh, the feats or the accomplishments of some hero, and of course our hero is Jesus. So you get the idea. Speak yourselves with psalms, all right, with hymns, and then we have with spiritual songs. Now, spiritual songs is kind of a it's kind of a nebulous term. It, there's two words here: pneumatikos and ode. All right, we get our word ode from ode. In fact, it's spelled, when you transliterate ode out of the Greek into English, it's spelled exactly the same as ode. And so Webster's defines an ode as a poem which, in which a person expresses a strong feeling of love or respect for someone or something. Okay? A poem that expresses a strong feeling of love. And then... The other word, pneumatikos, that's used all through the New Testament for a bunch of different things. Basically, it refers to anything that has to do with our spirits or the Holy Spirit. I'll give you some examples. Uh, we're all given spiritual gifts. Okay, It's the same word, pneumatikos. Um, Paul says that you who are spiritual should be able to help out somebody that's getting off track and bring them back to, to being, that's, that's if you're spiritual, all right? The word pneumatikos. Um, as God's children... We've, it says that we've received every blessing in, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, right? Peter, when we study the book of Peter, it says together we're being built together into a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices. It's that same word. So what I gather from all of this is that spiritual songs, remember what they were? Odes, all right? Love songs. They're love songs from our spirit to God's spirit, okay? It's expressing your love for God. So sing, right? We're told to do it over and over and over again. We're even told that God himself rejoices over us with singing. I just love that picture. It's, uh, by the way, that's in Zephaniah 317. I love the picture of God singing over me. It reminds me of, of you know, when I used to sing to my kids when they were little. You know, I can picture God singing to me as I drift off to sleep. So music is important, but I want you to understand that music is not synonymous with worship. It's not. Music is not worship. It can lead you to worship, but it's not worship. Okay? Now, if you've been in the church any length of time, you probably don't even think about how weird it is that God wants us to worship Him. <laughs> but I want you to stop and think about that for a second. Why would a being who's totally self-sufficient, who needs nothing, want to be worshipped. I mean, if anybody, you know, if, if you knew anybody that wanted to be worshipped and went around trying to get people to worship them, you'd think that either they're really needy or a little crazy, right? And don't get me wrong, everybody likes praise. Praise is, is a good thing. We should encourage each other. You know, it makes you feel, praise makes you feel good about yourself, helps give you confidence, Builds you up so that you, you know, can, can deal with life and you, you feel appreciated. But is that why God wants us to worship Him? I mean, and He does want us to worship Him. There's a, there's a very telling passage in John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and He says that true worshipers are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
It doesn't matter where you were. You know, he's, he's setting a new precedent. precedent okay? The Jewish people, they were supposed to worship in Jerusalem. And, and this lady was saying, yeah, but our forefathers said we should worship here in this mountain. We should bring our sacrifices here. Jesus cuts right, right through the middle of all of that and said it doesn't have anything to do with where you worship. You know, true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. We'll, we'll get back to that. But Jesus goes on to say that God is actively seeking those kind of people for worshipers. But why? Why? Surely he doesn't need his ego stroked. You know, he doesn't lack confidence. He, you know, he certainly doesn't need our praise to feel good about himself. So why is God seeking worshipers? And why do we not find that weird? I, to me, it's, it just is, seems weird. Well, in order to answer that question, we need to look at a number of things. Uh, first of all, we need to go back and ask our first question over there. Maybe find an answer for that. What is worship? Well, there's two words in the, in the Bible that are translated worship. One is the Greek word uh, proskuneo, and the other one is the Hebrew word shaka. All right? So shaka literally means to prostrate yourself. That means you, you get down on your belly and you put your face in the dirt in front of some dignitary. Kings, you know, kings would come through and they would demand that their subjects shaka before them. All right? People shakaed in front of the, the Baals and the Ashtoreth and the other false gods, Molech. All right? They get down on their face on the ground. And the word proskuneo, the Greek word, isn't much better. It refers to a dog licking its master's hand. What, what could it possibly mean that God wants that from us? That doesn't sound to me like the God who revealed himself in the person of Jesus. I can't imagine Jesus wanting people to act that way. Well, let's see if we can figure it out. Let's, let's start by going back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. I'm sorry I don't have anything on the screen for you to look at. You know, you have to trust me or write it down and look it up yourself or follow along. All right? Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. God speaking. He says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all I please. So what's going on here? Is, it, is God bragging? <laughs> Absolutely not. He's, he's, he's simply stating the truth. He isn't saying, I'm the best God there is. Right? He's not saying that. He's saying, there isn't another one. Right? There is no one else out here. I'm it. There are no other gods. Not any real ones anyway. Not ones that can create worlds. Not, not, not ones that can create people. Not ones that, that have a character of, of love and justice. There's only one God. And we exist because he decided to make us. Everything that he makes is good. In fact, there's no good apart from him. There is no good apart from God. That kind of explains a lot of things. I mean, we could go places with that. We're not going to do that. It kind of, it kind of explains hell. Okay? When, it, when it talks about, you know, you're going to be separated from God forever. Okay? Because you choose to. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be with him. Well, he's the only source of good. What's left? Anyway, we're not going to go there. Um, so, there's no good apart from him. In fact, <laughs> there's nothing at all apart from him. He is the source of everything that exists. And he knows, he knows how we are intended to function. I mean, who knows more about an invention than the inventor, right? I, you know, I can, I can, you know, I, I, I've had computers for years, right? You ask me to build a computer, I have no idea. I don't know how they work. I just know they work, right? I have lots of stuff that I use and I make use of, but I don't know how they're made, right? And when we, when we get something new, we get a, 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 you know, a new appliance, a new car, a new tool, we, we look at, the, well, at least some of us, look at the owner's manual, right? 
to see what the manufacturer's recommendations are. Uh, personally, I don't. I just tear the package open and start using it, whether I know how to use it or not. But, but that's what you're supposed to do. We, we, we read about how it's supposed to be maintained. You know, how often should you change the oil? You know, uh, how it should be used. It always amazes me some of the crazy things that say, don't use it for this. Don't use the, don't cut your hair with the grass clippers. You know, that, but we're supposed to find out what to do and what not to do by looking at what the manufacturer, the one who invented it, the one who made it, they know the most about it. So they're the people that we go to, all right? You see, God isn't interested in having us grovel on the ground in front of him. He doesn't want us as pets, you know, who's going to lick up his, lick his hand when he comes home. <laughs> he simply wants us to be aware that our, our very existence depends on him. And as, a, a, and as the one who invented us, he knows what's going to complete us. He knows what's going to make us happy. He knows what it's going to take for us to reach our full potential. Everybody wants to re be all that you can be, you know. I guess you could go join the army. But God knows what you can be, all right. And when he empowers you, you know, he can make you be able to do whatever he needs you to do, all right. How we're going to be the most, we want fulfillment in life. Well, the only place you're going to find that is with the person who made you and knows what you can do, what knows what your potential is, know how you can be fulfilled. Take a look at, at Proverbs, okay? Everybody knows, not everybody, I'm sure, but, but I, I have a feeling you've heard this before. It's one of the ones that people memorize. Proverbs 3, 5 to 7. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So think about it. It's simple, really. God just wants us to realize that there's a huge difference between us and him. You know, it's, it's not so that we'll feel bad about ourselves. You know, he doesn't want us to feel bad. About, he, we're the king's kids, for heaven's sakes. You know, he, he just wants us to be completely aware that he knows what's best for us. And he wants us to live our lives in a way that show that we recognize that fact. That we recognize that he's God and we're not. I know you parents know what I'm talking about, okay? You know, there are, there are all kinds of things that are bad for your kids. And you tell them, don't do that, right? And you hope that they'll listen to you. you know, at first, it's just to try to keep them alive, right? You know, and say, don't touch the stove. Don't play in the street. Don't eat the oleander flowers. Uh, you know, don't play with the rattlesnake. We had, <laughs> we had I always laugh because Sean's always talking about playing with rattlesnakes. You know, when I lived in Mojave, we used to go out and play with rattlesnakes. I guess his parents didn't tell him that. But, you know... <laughs> We're, we, we try to help them know what's, we try to keep them safe and healthy. And then as they get a little bit older, you know, it's more about the kind of character that we want them to have when they grow up. We want them to be honest. We want them to be brave and, and kind and hard workers. And we want them to take care of us when we're old, you know. But we hope and we expect that they're going to recognize that we have the authority, that we have the knowledge to guide them into good things and to help them avoid the bad things, right? We hope and, and we expect that they're going to do just what that verse says. Acknowledge, all right? Acknowledge our wisdom and choose to obey us. And the truth is we, we do know what's best for them, at least at the beginning, right? Right? But it's not very long before they, you know, they begin to question our authority. You know, we, <laughs> the verse says that we don't want them to rely on their own understanding. Because, you know, their, their own understanding is, is going to lead this, the little ones to say, Yeah, broccoli is yucky and cookies are good. And so all I want to eat is cookies. Or, or, you know, playing the street is actually kind of fun. I like it. It's a whole lot better than our front yard. Their little wills know exactly what they want. And more often than not, what they want isn't good for them. And it's definitely not what we want for them. And then, of course, as they get a little bit older, 
the consequences of not listening to what you have to, to say to your kids gets more serious, doesn't it? Some of the choices that, that kids make in, in junior high and high school can have long-term lasting effects on their character and, and their future. And you know, if they would just listen to us, if they would, you know, we could help them avoid so many heartaches, so many mistakes, if they would just listen to us. And here's the point. I really believe that that is all God wants from us. That and just to, to love Him and appreciate Him. You know, we've been created in His image. And you know, in the same way that we desire to be loved and appreciated and obeyed by our kids, so does He. Same exact reason. You know, and as the one who loves us the most, more than any other person, and, and who's infinitely wiser than we are about what we really need, He wants to be loved and listened to, respected for who He is. And all of that is not for His benefit. It's not to help Him. He wants us to have this attitude for our benefit. It's a heart attitude. It's a, it's a mindset. It's a way of life. A, 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 a moment by moment acknowledging that He knows best. Every now and then when, uh, you know, I can't find anything good on TV, we'll, we'll flip through and, and, and find, go, to, go to the classics. And there's a, a television show on there from the 50s called Father Knows Best. And of course, you know, the dad, Robert Young, he, he doesn't really always know what's best. He makes lots of mistakes, and that's where the humor comes from. And we make mistakes with our kids too. But our Heavenly Father never does. He really does know what's best for us. And us giving into that knowledge, trusting Him moment by moment with our life choices, well, that's just smart on your part, okay? Over in Romans uh, chapter 11, Paul is, you know, he's, he's going at length talking about, about how wise God is and, and, and how brilliant His plan of salvation is and how merciful He is. So he spent all this time talking about, about how great God's plan is, how, how brilliant he is, how merciful he is. And then, and then in the very first part of Romans 12, which we've studied before, but it really applies here. He makes this observation. He says that in view of God's mercy, not to mention his wisdom and, and his love for you, you know, what he's done for you. In view of all of that, it's only reasonable that we should offer ourselves back to him. King James uses the term, it's a reasonable service, okay? If you've got a newer translation, it usually says something about that it's our true and proper worship. And guess what? Both of those things are correct. It is reasonable. It only makes sense that we would give ourselves completely, body and soul, as it were, to the person who's already given himself completely to us, okay? But it also gives us a very clear and a very precise explanation of what worship is. It's simply offering ourselves back to God. David recognized it in Psalm 51. He said, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. It's not about religious service. It's not about religion at all. He said, the sacrifice that you desire is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite Heart, oh God, you will not despise. Then over in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66, God is talking and he says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is a house that you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. That's how they came into being. Look, there's nothing I need. Nothing that you can do or make for me is something that I need. I built everything that exists. But then he goes on and he says, But to this one I will look. This is the one I will pay attention to. That gets my, this is the person that gets my attention. The one who is humble and contrite of spirit. And who trembles at my word. Our dad just wants us to listen to him. To acknowledge that, that he knows best. You know, to recognize that he has a legitimate claim on our lives. Those ancient words, shaka and proskuneo, prostrating yourself, licking the hand of your master. Those are human ideas of how to demonstrate to another person that you consider them greater than you. And God certainly is greater, 
by far than we are. But that's not what he wants. He doesn't want us to grovel. What he wants is a mind that acknowledges that he knows best. What he wants is a, a will that isn't full of itself, you know, that knows that it doesn't know everything, that chooses, you know, okay, I'm going to set aside what I want because I know God knows better, okay? And I'm going to choose to obey my dad. He wants a heart that loves him for what he's done for us. You see, that attitude is what worship really is, okay? And it should be happening 24-7 all the time. It should be an attitude that pervades everything that we do. Just a, a, a constant recognizing that God is God. You know, it can, it can be expressed in a thousand ways, and it should be. Every opportunity that you have, kindness to a stranger, you know, helping somebody move. That's always a big one on my part. I just had to do that. And it's hard. Oh, I don't want to. Don't ask me to move. Ask me anything, but help, don't ask me to move, help you move, all right? Maybe, maybe it's mowing somebody's lawn, you know, that elderly person or somebody that's, you know, can't get out and, and do it themselves. And, of course, you know, yes, it's, it's gonna, it can be expressed in church ways, too. You know, teaching a Sunday school, school class, you know, stacking chairs, Helping with vacation Bible school. Hmm. That's a scary thought for me. Anyway, it's not about what you do. It's not about what you're doing. It's about why you're doing it. Okay? Do you understand? And sure, yes. Yes, sing psalms, you know. Of course, with guitar accompaniment, because that's what it means. All right? And, and sing hymns, you know, hymns praising our hero Jesus, praising his accomplishments. Yes, pour out your spirit your, in music that expresses your love for your Savior. And let that music do what it's supposed to do. All right? What, it's not, it, that's not worship. It, but it helps us. It helps remind us of what worship is. Worship is offering ourselves to God. It's a life lived every moment with the understanding that God is God, and I'm not. I owe my very existence to Him. He loves me. He knows what's best for me. This is the one I will pay attention to. This is the one that gets my attention. The one who's humble and contrite and who trembles at my word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. <laughs> you are, are so much greater <laughs> to the point that we can't even understand or imagine who and what you are other than what you've revealed. And you've revealed enough. You've revealed yourself in the person of Jesus. We know how much you love us. The fact that you were willing to die in our place, take our punishment upon yourself. Help us to love you back. Help us to offer ourselves. It's the only reasonable thing we can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.